Hi Mama, you're listening to the Mama Podcast. It's Samaya here, the co-founder of Mama Emmy app. Mama Emmy is the first app to exclusively connect mothers across the Middle East, connect with like-minded mamas and create lifelong friendships. At Mama, we are all about connecting mamas to empower women. So let's join together and make this mission a reality. Today, I'm joined by the lovely Nevena. She's Dubai's number one harmonious family expert and coach, author, and speaker. Over the last decade, Nevena has worked with over 600 families, helping them rebuild harmony and set their children on the right path. Let's listen into today's episode. Hi, Nevena. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and welcome to the Mama podcast. Thank you, Sumaya. It's a pleasure being here and I'm a big fan of everything you're doing. The app, connecting with you was so amazing and thank you for having me. Yeah, I've learned so much from you already and I know you'll share so much information in this podcast. So um, let's get started straight away. Can we start with you just giving us a background and the listeners a little bit of a background of um, what, what you do now and what led you to that as well? Well, at the moment I do few few things but I like to say in general who am I I'm someone who is very passionate about life passionate about children and families and um, currently I mostly work in coaching I have my coaching online programs group coaching individual coaching and I help families rebuild the harmony uh, because most of the families they struggle with negative emotions uh, this is what we discovered through my decade of my work. So they struggle with anxiety, fears, worries, overthinking, uh, you know, this is, and we feel very overwhelmed. And then we notice that usually when your children are between two and seven years old, this is when parents report that it's the most difficult for them. They lose the harmony in a way children now uh, want much more attention from you, right? And then maybe have a second child. And then you have your work, your husband is balancing his work, you're balancing your work. So, um, you know, and then people are like, oh my God, this is not the relationship we had before. We are so tired, we're overwhelmed. Uh, you're enjoying it, but it can be very stressful. And this is where I jump in. Uh, I really help people enjoy parenting more, uh, rebuild stronger relationships relationship and move, you know, I like to say from good to outstanding because a lot of people are having prejudice. Oh, if we, if we ask for help when it comes to family, it means that we are doing something wrong. It means that I'm not a good mother or I'm not a good father. And I always like to say, it's not about that. It's about really going on the next level. We can always become better. We can always learn more. And our relationships with our children, with our partner, with our you know, uh, family, now you have grandparents who wanna be involved. It can be very complicated, different cultures as well. So we, we just wanna make this family harmonious as much as possible so everybody are joyful and happy. But let me just go step back so people know a little bit more about my background as well. I'm originally from Serbia. And I think a part of my passion, I think big part of my passion comes from my personal journey. Um, I didn't grow up in harmonious family. Uh, my parents would stay together 25 years, but it wasn't a harmony at all. Um, and they didn't have a good relationship. And I think I learned so much from it. I learned the things when parents asked me, oh, will this... We're going to talk about this today, right? But will this influence my child? And then they're not aware of some other things that really influence the children. And I think because I went through that myself, you know, I, I really remember some small things when I was very young that kind of hurt us. You know, parents don't do this intentionally, but they leave an impact on us. And we all have these memories, right? We all leave. Why, why are parents didn't do this or that? Of course, I always like to say parents do the best they can in that, that, that point. Um, and we never, never should blame our parents for anything, but we just want to have an understanding and see later on as we grow up how to rebuild that relationship. And me, I'm very happy that I managed to rebuild relationship with my dad specifically through everything we've been through and this was my personal journey because I went through so much you know negative emotions and before hate and anger um, and then I was disappointed also because I didn't have the support and I, I, I had to learn so much I had my coaches I learned from Tony Robbins and others and I learned so much about myself and when we go to our personal journey then I believe we can truly help others but then my background, I loved working with children. I started working with children when I was 15. And I was in a university for child development and psychology. 
specifically specializing in working with children with spe uh, special needs. And I went to uh, sign up when I was 20 years old to volunteer in our government orphanage. And we had around 400 children over there. And there were most of them, 80%, 90% children with disabilities. So it was an incredible learning experience for me because what I learned also that what I'm studying in university doesn't necessarily bring results in practice. So I'm someone who is very passionate about really looking for solution in practice and find people who can teach you. And you know, from the Tony Robbins testimonial himself, he was my mentor, he said, in the, what he mentioned, the most stressful environment are those practical environment because when you are there in orphanage, when you are now trying to support child development and nothing is working, you have to find solution. Okay, how I build this? Why is this child behaving like this? What is triggering them? And so on. And my coaching journey started over there. I joined a, a center. We had a daily center and we had parents who were supposed to come and uh, you know, bring, uh, pick, uh, take the children back because for certain reasons, the social service will just take the child for some time. And then we would assess parents and see if they're ready emotionally, if they're ready financially, if they can really give support. So this is where my coaching journey started. I've been in Dubai for four years now. And I also had a pleasure to really manage a group of nurseries here, um, uh, which was an incredible experience. And what I love about Dubai that gave me a lot of knowledge about uh, traditions, a lot of knowledge about how culture and how depending on which culture we grow up and what our parents teach us, how we represent this to our children. So I can see that here we had 83 nationalities in, in nurseries in Dubai. So it was an incredible experience. And um, yes, I'm a published author of, of a book, Nursery Yes or No, and my second book is coming out soon. It's gonna be specifically about this topic that we are talking about parenting and the emotions. Uh, parents go through. So yes, I mean, uh, this is it. I, I also had a pleasure to train. I work closely with schools and nurseries. I train professionals because I believe it's a congruent circle, right? You have teachers, you have parents, you have children, and everybody are engaged and everybody has to be on the a, on a same page. So in the last three, four years, I trained over, I don't know, thousands of professionals, uh, managers, leaders, and teachers. So it's, it's a pleasure to hear their opinions and their parents as well. So it's, it's constant learning and I'm very passionate about it. And um, I'm just feeling so grateful and blessed for everything I am able to do. It's incredible what you've been um, up to over the last sort of four, four years in Dubai and then previous to that as well. And honestly, you're so inspiring. I, every time I have a conversation with you, I learn something new. So um, yeah, I'm so like grateful that, I can speak to you and like, you know, you're here talking to me today. Um, I think you touched on quite a few things there and I'm really interested to find out about the cultures, but I think if we go into that conversation right now, we'll probably end up in a deeper hole of like a completely different conversation. Um, so maybe something to talk about at some stage um, in the future, but I'd really love to talk about um, what, or how we impact our children. So what we do as parents can, um, and how that impacts children in a positive and a negative way, because I know obviously we try to do everything that's helpful and we want them to grow in a certain way, but how, like what are those things? And I'm sure you've got a lot of um, information on that as well. Yeah, well, first I always like to start that, you know, parenting is about us, not our children. And I think you and me, we had this conversation before, but uh, you know, you have to understand, we have to understand that it's our personal journey. We have to become better. And uh, unfortunately we always say, oh, my child is triggering me. They're not listening to me and so on. So I'm like, you know, they're not there to listen to you. We are there to guide them. We are there to guide them and raise them to become the best version of themselves. But we also have to remember we are role models. And I would start with this. I think uh, we like to say uh, children don't uh, listen, they're watching. So if you're saying one thing, but then doing another thing, you're gonna have opposite results, right? Children are observed. If you're telling them to be calm and kind, and then you go to the supermarket and you shout at someone, you know, they're gonna learn to behave this way. So we cannot teach one thing, preach one thing and leave another, another one. 
Um, and it's a, it's a journey for ourselves. I mean, for me, we always all have everyday challenges to become better, to be more kind, to react in stressful situation and let go of other things. And another thing, uh, first one, right? Understanding parenting is about us. And another thing, our journey. And second thing I would like to mention is understanding of child development in general, understanding of the mind. And this is something I learned, and I think the most powerful information I learned is from my mentor, Bob Proctor. He's a pioneer in mindset. I, I absolutely love Bob. And I learned from him, he actually simplified, you know, read so many books in psychology, conscious mind, subconscious mind. But if you have a chance, you know, I, from my heart, I don't, you know, get anything from recommending, but Bob is really one you can find so many materials on the mind and our behavior from him. And what he did, he very simplified things. And once I learned this, it gave me such a clear picture why we behave in a certain way and how are children also learning. So we're gonna to touch on this point, but first we, I would start by saying that, you know, we, we learned that we know we have conscious and subconscious mind. But to understand it, we, we like to say that Conscious mind is uh, intellectual mind, right? So it's the mind where we collect information and you can have a lot of information, but then you don't have to have any results. And I'm sure you know someone like this, right? They are so smart. They, they can have the best education, but in life, they don't get any results. And then we have all those entrepreneurs like Richard Branson, you know, and all of those successful people, even Bob Proctor, he didn't finish he's talking about himself, right? He didn't even finish high school and they, they have tremendous success. So he was the one first who was obsessed, right? Why we do things and we get those results. And when I start studying this in depth and working with him, um, I really started understanding myself and then understanding children because I've been working with children for so long and I see how we can get really good results with them. Um, so the first thing I, I like to mention now is we have to understand what is subconscious mind. And subconscious mind is the part of the mind where basically we collect our habits, right? And we function on the habits. Um, so everything you do in the morning, your, your brain and your mind actually want to create habits so you don't have to think about every single uh, thing you do. So if you have to get up and brush your teeth, you're not going to think how you're going to do it. You're not going to think how to open things, how to put your trousers and so on. And uh, this is very uh, interesting for me because we start collecting habits and as we have habits, what we do in the morning, what we do during the day, what do we do with our free time and so on. This is something that was, um, that it brings us results. And when it comes to children in the first six to seven years, we always say this is golden years, right? Because what we do in this time is gonna really reflect and build children character, build their personality. And interesting information that I learned is that the subconscious mind is completely open which means everything we pour in is going to, you know, leave some kind of mark on children. And we want to really be cautious what we are doing. And one of the things that uh, we want to understand is that even if you play something on the TV that's not appropriate and the child is just playing in the corner, they're still listening to something and it will go to their mind. Um, and uh, we want to be cautious of things we are saying, right, and um, things that we are exposing children too, because it can sometimes uh, leave, you know, we can have, they can have nightmares and bad dreams because they're not understanding it yet. So um, to start, to, to continue, right? So we have now the mind that is open. And when I learned this, this also helped me understand how we learn languages, for example, and why we can learn any language in the world. So children, as the subconscious mind is open, but when we expose them to, for example, different languages, they cannot reject and say, no, I'm not going to learn English or French or Arabic. So they are listening to it and they going to learn it. Of course, how much and how good will depend also if they have opportunity to use the language. So this, when I start studying and then I start applying it to different areas, especially language, for example, it makes so much sense because everything we are pouring in, they cannot reject. Uh, okay. Behavior that we are teaching them, information we are giving to them, they gonna adopt the behavior. You know, very funny in UAE, you have this culture, for example, people from India, how they have their body language and you see a small child who is, you know, nodding their head, which is so funny, right? They're copying everything yeah. they see in the family. 
and uh, it's incredible, right? They, then they speak the way, the same way the mom speaks, they use the same vocabulary. So they're learning based on the things they're exposed to. And uh, I mean, in all different cultures, we can see the way the vocabulary and, and language and so on. So this is incredibly interesting for me and I'm still learning and always learning more. And I think as we continue, uh, we're gonna talk specific on some things I also noticed and I know we shouldn't do. And then some things that we should do to really set our children for success and build confidence and self-esteem in them. Yeah, I think so we all want to raise a confident and em empathic human and yeah, I'd love to hear what those things are to be able to um, raise a confident, independent, thoughtful, you know, all these traits that we really don't do want in our child. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, I don't know if you want to speak about this topic today or we keep it for another because it's a whole difficult, different topic. But um, if you agree, I would just stay with some things that let's, let's maybe start with five things that we, we shouldn't do. Right. Sure. Um, if, if you're fine with it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, I think I lead. I'll, yes. I don't want to direct you off topic completely because um, yeah, let's stick to what we agreed, which is let's talk about the positives and negatives of how we can, raise a more responsibly raise a child yeah because there is so much information and i know if we go into raising confidence and independence we're just gonna stay there <laughs> so maybe we can we can arrange for another another episode if the listeners would love to hear that this as well so um first thing i would like to say very important to understand is children um we have higher faculties so some some capabilities and things of mind that makes us different than the animals and one of the things is imagination right and also reasoning which means ability to think about our thinking so when you have a thought you can say oh is this thought good or bad or uh, how why am i thinking this why am i now feeling this way right we can we can analyze and evaluate our thinking and another another uh, higher faculty we have is for example imagination and imagination is so powerful tool and unfortunately educational system and families are very often suppressing imagination. They will tell you, stop fantasizing, stop looking through the window. You, you don't live in the real world, right? Even when we are adults and you have a dream and you want to achieve something, they say, that's not gonna work. You're not realistic. So they tell you to be realistic. And if we really look around ourselves, if you look at this laptop, if you look at your car, if you look and you think 100 years ago, none of this exists, right? If you look at a painting, so everything we created came from someone's mind. It was once only an idea, right? And imagination is so powerful. And I truly believe the things we imagine, if we really work towards it, if we you know, invest some kind of work to think over them, you know, they say we become what we think. So we can create our life. And I experienced this in my life, changed the direction of my life so many times. And I now understand, I have the awareness and I understand how powerful this is. So as parents, we don't wanna kill imagination, right? We wanna let children play as much as possible and as longer as possible, right? A lot of culture are so focused on academic skills, on reading and writing and math, and they think child is super smart if they know, you know, all the alphabet. And um, this is topic on itself, but uh, very important to understand that we wanna foster imagination in children and we want to let them play because through play, they're learning so much and they need to have at least few hours a day to play, even when they're, you know, 10, 11, they should have some time to play and do some sports. I love sports so much. So imagination, killing imagination and suppressing imagination, telling children to be realistic, to not fantasize. Uh, it's, it's the first thing we wanna avoid doing because it's something that can really make it very powerful. Uh, on, on the opposite, what you want to do in this situation is you want to keep asking children questions. Oh, how do you imagine this? Why you want to do it? Um, what happened then if they're telling you a story, if they're playing with their dolls or if they're playing with their Legos? You want to keep asking them what happened then? What, you know, what did she do? What did she say? And you just listen and you're going to see how your child observes you know, the, the world how they observe the world, how much they know. Um, and then you wanna see what moral 
last time we want to teach them and what kind of, like you said, a kind person, empathic person we want them to become. Uh, second thing I think we, we have to avoid definitely is like mocking and making jokes on, on children sometimes. And in different cultures, this is something I've been through. And I always tell to my mom, like, why would you do and say this? But they don't have awareness. They were raised in the same way. So, you know, they would mock, they would say, ha ha, you're so ugly. Or uh, I, I found a video, I didn't have my teeth. My mom says, ha ha, look at you, you don't have teeth. And I was so confident, I would say, I don't care. You know, and I would just keep singing and dancing on the video. It was so much fun to see. And I, I looked at myself and I said, wow, like children are so confident. But if we keep doing this, it really can suppress their confidence. So telling children mocking in a way like a joke and some cultures, they believe it's going to make them stronger. I think it's in my culture as well, like, you know, uh, make them tougher. Mm. I don't know. We've been through so much. I'm from Serbia. We had, you know, when I was growing up, wars and things. So people just wanted you to be tough, you know. Um, so I think definitely something you want to avoid telling your children, you know, uh, even, even sometimes as a joke, like, oh, you're dumb, you're stupid and things like that. Because what happens if they listen and hear it so many times, it impress in their mind and subconscious mind and they create a self image of themselves as ugly or chubby. You know, they always call me chubby when I wasn't chubby. And then I had the self image of myself that I'm chubby <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not actually chubby. Why I believe this about myself? Because because it was suppressed around my family as a kind of joke or you know sometimes we love children say you are my monkey and things like that so why would we call them these words so we want to be very very careful um, about that and um, uh, also things like saying a lot of people are saying oh you're naughty um, uh, you know you're a bad boy or you're a bad girl what we want to do is di differentiate behavior from uh, child. So if, you, if a child is not doing something correctly, you want to tell them that you're very disappointing, uh, disappointed in their behavior, but not in them, right. that their behavior is not okay. Because if you, if you behave in a different way, they're going to have different results. If you want to, in a way, punish them, I don't know, maybe take their iPad, if they're really not listening and you now don't know what to do, you want to say, you know what, I want to let you know that you, this behavior of yours, it's not all right. And that's why this is the consequence. We had the children in nurseries, they always torn books, right? They still don't know they're torning books. So we tried, we talked to them. And then a few times we had to remove the books. So they would mm -hmm. come and they would be like, where are the books? And we said, no, this is the consequence. You don't get any books because you keep torning them. But it doesn't mean that the child is bad by doing it, it's just the behavior. So mm -hmm. now they learn, okay, this is the consequence for the behavior. If I change my behavior, I will get different results. So uh, very, very important differentiation and not telling them you're naughty girl, you're not just telling me you are not behaving nice right now. And then, you know, ask them to change their behavior, but never express that you're disappointed in them, in them as a person and they're a bad person. And because it really creates a self image that's gonna just, you know, naughty boy, if you tell them you're naughty, you're naughty, you're naughty, they grow up, they're teenagers, they're going to look for trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Because they believe they're naughty. It's just the self-image we created. Very powerful, very important. And so it's, it's the same the other way around as well, right? The same with saying good girl, good boy. Um, so my question to you is, we are still, I think people are more aware of it now, yet we are still in a society where it's still very common. People still use those words a lot. So even if you're, say, for example, in the playground and another parent sees your child doing something, their response to that is, oh, well done or good girl or good job or whatever it might be. But it's a very sort of, um, they associate it with the person. And so would that, do you think having like a school teacher or someone who's an outside person saying those things, would that have the same impact on the child? If say, for example, your child is at school and the teacher uses those words, oh, that's naughty, naughty boy. Would that have the same impact on the child as it would if the parents are using the same words? 
It has, especially in the first years, I believe it has, because people around us, and especially in nurseries and schools, they spend a lot of hours. And they also have attachment, you know, with, pair, with teachers. Uh, I don't know, I remember something my teacher said that hurt me emotionally, you know, when they were unfair, they gave this mark to this boy, and it wasn't fair, they didn't give it to me. So we really, we really remember these things. So I think uh, it has to be the, this kind of fairness and also awareness. Uh, a lot of teachers, they do have training. Some, they, they're not aware of it yet. Uh, but I think very important is, you know, that they are trained, they understand, and also parents understand as well. So it can have impact. For the positive things, um, I mean, we do want to build a positive self-image because if somebody believes they're good, they're behaving good, right? Um, then yes, they should be praised for it. And praising is something you want to incorporate as much as possible, right? Right? But also you can tell them, wow, this was really nice behavior. So if, if, be, if before, for example, they were not listening or something was happening, now they're playing very nicely. You want to just go ahead and tell them, wow, you're, uh, you know, playing so nice. I'm so happy. Right. So you tell them that now you are happy because of their behavior right. um, and, uh, and things like that. And it doesn't always have to be connected with rewards. A lot of parents want to, you know, okay, if you are good, I'm going to give you a reward. So I always say don't negotiate with children. They need to learn that they need to behave a certain way, even nobody uh, rewards them. You go to work and you work hard and I don't know, you maybe never get rewarded, <laughs> right? So in life, we're not going to always get a reward. So children also have to learn that they should behave good and play nicely and play good just to play good this is the behavior it's acceptable and not to get the reward and and very young they're going to start maybe when your two-year-old daughter is now maybe starting to negotiate with you okay i'm going to do it if i get an ice cream or if we go for a walk so uh, you want to stop it in a way saying okay you can get an ice cream today uh you know but not that's not the reason why we are going outside or why we, you know yeah. so we want to really make sure that they learn to behave a certain way not just to get a reward uh, sure. for the reward yeah and then let me move if you're fine with it, let me move uh to another thing um i think it's very important to sometimes children have um they need our support if they're disappointed, if somebody hurt them, you know, if they had a fight with friends. And it's very important as parents, one mistake is if we don't give them a, a proper support, if we're not listening to them, uh, if uh, they have a need to express their emotions, because we do want uh, children and people in general to learn to express their emotions. And we can see this differentiation between men and women because society was kind of teaching men, if you're a boy, they say, stop crying, you're a boy, right? And if they have a need to cry, they, it should be fine that they're crying. Uh, if they need help, if they need support, and men are also very, very emotional. They're very emotional, they need care, and they struggle, uh, this is what I see through my work in coaching, they struggle so much because they don't know how to express their emotions. Uh, they believe that it's a shame you know, to ask for help or support. And this is something that just society taught them. So if children have some kind of needs to express themselves, they didn't have a need to be cuddled and give comfort, we don't want to avoid it. We, we don't want to tell them, you know, toughen up. We, we really want to support them in that as well. Uh, and then let me move to a fourth one. Um, fourth thing you want to avoid is as parents, husband and wife, or two, uh, you know, um, uh, two parents, you want to avoid having opposite opinions. So you want to avoid one parent saying no, another parent saying yes. And this was happening constantly in my family. And you have to understand your child see you as one and see you as a family. So when you say no and yes, now child feels like they're separated, they're literally torn, and they don't understand, should they listen this side and should they listen that side? And many parents, uh, sometimes we maybe do it unintentionally, but very often we do it because of relationship we have with, with one another. And um, it's, it's very important we communicate. So we want to be on the same page with our partner so they understand, okay, I don't want them, uh, you know, I didn't give them, for example, ice cream because of this. If I say they shouldn't have ice cream every time, I need you to support me. And sometimes, you know, um, let's say a dad who is working a lot, they feel bad because they don't see them often. So now they're just happy. They're like, so what is the big deal? Just give them ice cream or I'm going to buy them a toy. And you really want to communicate and say, you know, this was the, I, 
I understand your point of view, but this is my point of view. And we want to be consistent because children learn through consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are not consistent, we then just torn them and, and make a confusion for them. Uh, this is the fourth thing. And then the fifth one is um, saying no without explanation. And this is something we do on an everyday basis. We just tell them, no, no, stop it. No, no. And they don't understand, no, why we're saying no, especially when they're very young, two years old, three years old, they are now very intrigued. Why are they telling me, no, don't go there. Don't climb here. Uh, we try to protect them, but we don't see from their perspective. So they're just trying to explore and they want to know what's going to happen. Right. So uh, very important that if we give no and we say no to children, they have to um, we have to explain why we're saying no. If they are, you know, uh, rocking on the chair, this is example I often mention. You want to tell them, you know, can you please stop rocking on the chair because you can hurt and bump your head, and then um, they, they understand what's the consequence of their behavior. Right. If they continue doing it and they fell down, now they start crying, you're gonna tell them, you know, I already explained you and you decided to keep doing it. So next time, you know, maybe you can listen because and learn from things that we are telling you. So very, very important that we just don't tell them no. Also, if they're asking for something, you know, can I go and play with my friends or can I do when they're a little bit older? Uh, can I do this? And we just tell them no, you know, like. This is because I said so, you know, yeah. some parents say, because I said so. And then you remember probably yourself, sometimes parents, and you're like, I'm a good child. Why are they telling me no? I just want to go and play or I just want to do this. And um, we have to look into ourselves in our emotional state, why we are forbidding this, why, uh, and maybe explain to the child, no, today we're busy, I'm not able to drive you, or... Um, I cannot organize my time, right? We want to tell them and they have to understand this is family. So we function together. Not always we can accommodate everything, uh, but telling them just no, they're going to be sometimes hurt and confused, especially as they're growing towards teenage age. We tend to tell them, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot go out. Uh, and they, then sometimes I remember myself, I'm like, well, I'm a good child. We don't do anything wrong. We just want to be out, go for a walk and so ever. And uh, parents sometimes just, you know, try to control your something <laughs> so i think very very important that um, we explain them why we we said no or you know to, to certain things that's really um interesting i love um all of those points especially i think the example of the ice cream like really resonates with me um and it's so true right like it it's it's the case all the time, but it's to remember that, you know, you should discuss this um, together and actually have like a joint approach to it. Um, especially with little things like that, you sometimes don't realize what impact that will have on your child. Um, so that's all the negative stuff. Let's move on to the things that we can do to have a like the positive um, impacts that we can have on it. Obviously, if we avoid these things, then we'll have a positive impact on the child. Yeah. But these are the things that we should be avoiding. But what are the things that we should be doing more of every day that will also have a positive impact on our child? Well, first of all, I'd like to, take, to tell parents, take care of yourself right you have to take care of yourself because if you don't you're not going to be emotionally if you don't have a good sleep if you don't nurture yourself if you you know if you like to meditate exercise take this time for yourself because as you feel better you're going to be able to be happier and enjoy more so this is number one thing definitely and i mentioned when we talked about imagination just allow children to have time to play uh, very important also to, from early years, teach children to play on their own, right? So they should be able to have some kind of time. They should have engagement with you, but also they can, should be able to teach, to play on their own, sit in the corner, play with a favorite toy, not always needing an adult attention. And this is what builds them in being more independent. And then, of course, if they want you, if they want to communicate with you or they ask you something to join for a little bit, uh, then you join and you play with them. So I think this helps them. And ask them those questions, like I mentioned, ask them what are they thinking about, what they're imagining, what would they like to do when they grow up, you know, so they're going to tell you all of these stories and just support their imaginations. Just tell them, wow, this is such a nice idea. I think it's, it's, uh, it's great, very creative and so on. 
And then uh, we said we want to avoid mocking, right? And opposite of that, um, uh, we want to praise children. So we talked about praising, I think very important, praising the behavior, um, uh, building the positive self-image of them. Of course, every child will have moments. They're going to have phases when they go through and their behavior can be you know, a little bit more difficult for us. They are, uh, and especially children who are very strong tempered, and very strong individuals. I think you are going through this, right? So they are really pushing the boundaries. They are trying what they can do, where their limits, you know, and they love to be in control of their life. So, so very funny to see them, how they're so young, uh, so tiny, but so powerful actually on the things they want. They know what they want to do. They know what they don't like. And we kind of want to keep this personality as they're growing up. So, uh, you know, even if we talked about this when we spoke last time, but yeah. you know, it's difficult for you as a parent to deal with a child that is stubborn. They know what they want. They're not going to, you know, listen sometimes. But we want to say, I want them to keep this when they're growing up because they're going to be strong decision makers so as well. That asks, I mean, I have a question then. So how much of what we do has an impact and how much of it is just personality? Because of course they have an element of their personalities because they're born with certain traits. And so how much can we have an impact on, on those things? As parents, uh, we can we can definitely have an impact. So when we studied when I studied psychology and behavior psychology, they believed like children are just born like empty board, right? And if you give me a child, I will make them a successful or I will make them a criminal. Um, and then we learned if this is not hundred percent true because we really have. Uh, we really have our, our own uh, temper, our own uh, personality, character, uh, and so on. So I don't believe children are blank at all. They do need our help to survive when they're young, but they are very, very their own, you know, spiritual beings. I believe we are spiritual beings. So, uh, but we can definitely make an impact, right? So you can create from a child, uh, we can see this in, in children who are sometimes going in, you know, uh, violence, growing in the family that are not emotionally supporting them. They can become extremely, uh, you know, unconfident. They can uh, uh, even, you know, not be successful because now they have full self-image of themselves. But uh, on the other hand, we can really build a child into having a strong image of themselves and support them to, to do things and keep going so they achieve uh, good results. That's interesting. Yeah. So I was just curious because it just, uh, you read everywhere that you are their guide and their mentor rather than, you know, like I think that's, that's pretty much um, everywhere you read now that the, the idea is that as a parent, you should be their guide. And I just wondered how much are you able to guide them over how much is actually just like, that they're born with so that's really interesting to hear we can guide them you know and one of the people also uh people i love to listen and read his books uh um, wayne dyer right he was such a powerful speaker and author and he spoke about parenting a lot he was a parent i think he had six or seven children wow. and i was very surprised i was listening to his podcast right and he was he was a, he's such a spiritual being and such an educated person. And then, for example, I was very surprised to hear uh, him saying that his daughter was having problem with nar narcotics, right, and addictions. Um, and you would say, oh, he's, you know, he's such a person who is always, you know, know how to lead, know how to give this certain freedom and support. But then, uh, you know, children go their own uh, way and sometimes they have to learn, they have to make mistakes. Very important. You know, parents tell you, don't do this. And we all fall in love and we had a broken heart, right? At least once in our life. So I believe we have to go through this. Yeah. We have to experience things on our own. So you have to guide them, but you also have to understand that, you know, they, they're going to make their own decision at the end of the day. And they have to understand there are going to be consequences for those decisions. You are there to support them. Uh, but uh, in certain things, he said something very interesting that he, um, in those situations, when he he deal with her addictions, he understood that she was actually in a way, you know, overprotected and uh, he needed her to step up and take responsibility. So he had to cut everything like financial support, everything for her. So she goes on her personal journey and she changed herself. Wow. So, you know, they have to, they have to, we have to do it on our own at the end of the day. And, 
Um, yeah, and it's interesting to see also when we're siblings, right? So how things can influence us in a different way. Yeah. Uh, I see my, I have a sister and a brother and I can see how much of a different I am with the sis, my sister. Um, so I use certain things that happened to me, like I became even stronger. I became, you know, uh, advocate for it. I'm so powerful by for her maybe the fact that her confidence she's a different different character so depends on our kind of foundation but we can still even go through the same thing we can become different people absolutely so there is no yeah there is no black and white answer i always say you know it's not like a wisdom and one solution fits all no and you can have same situation with your child uh, one week ago and once another time today and you're gonna it's gonna have completely opposite results right which is what makes parenting so difficult, I think, right? Because there's no black and white, there's no book, there's no guide that's the same for everybody. So yeah, I totally agree with that. I wish it was a bit simpler. Um, but yeah, there's so many factors that come into play when you're, when you're talking about children. Um, one thing I did want to ask you, because you touched on using like negative words or phrases to um, associated with a child instead of their behavior, how does it have the opposite impact in that if you tell a girl that she's beautiful or a boy that he's handsome, how does that impact them growing up? Because one thing that I've sort of learned and read is that you shouldn't really do that. But at the same time, if you don't then tell them that you, you think as a parent or as a mother or a father that you think they're beautiful or handsome, then doesn't that mean that they then feel that they're not? Um, I think it depends on our character. I think what we want to develop, because they're going to come across uh, children who's going to tell them you're stupid, you're ugly. And if they come through that, you want to tell them, you know, people are going to tell you a lot of things, but not everything people say is true. So what matters is what you think about yourself. And, uh, you know, some children, I don't know, I heard these stories and some children will say, no, but I'm not beautiful and, and so on. So you want to have them rebuild and understand that they are, right? They are beautiful and, and beauty is such a, you know, concept that there is no, <laughs> there is no, like, what is beautiful? Everybody consider different things beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very important that we learn, teach them to think on their own. This is the most important thing. So people are going to tell you a lot of things. People are going to tell you sometimes, you know, that you're stupid, that you're rude, that you're ugly. And children can be sometimes very mean, right? So they can fight mm -hmm. and say those things. And uh, for our child, we want to tell them, you know, uh, other people in life are going to tell you a lot of things, but they don't have to mean they're true. Only thing that's true is what you think about yourself. So you teach them to, and you ask them do you think you're stupid and if they say yes then you're gonna say well no look you you saw this solution you saw this game you were thinking you're speaking so you want to show them some facts that are not true right it's not true that the child is stupid or ugly um, and so on because you don't want them to be um focused on their appearance which is why I think that there's the advice of not sort of always telling them that they're beautiful or handsome and not constantly sort of telling them on that. But at the same time, you don't want them to have low self-esteem either. So, I mean, I don't see anything wrong if we tell them. We should also tell them, you know, that we love them. Uh, but I think we should have balance on reflecting on their behavior or how they are as a person, personality. You know, like when they're funny, you can tell them they're funny uh, and things like that. It's not always a focus uh, on being beautiful and being um, handsome. But I think we should balance with other characteristics as well, right? So they understand that they have a lot of qualities in them, which makes us a, pers a person person right yeah. so it's more about our character at the end of the day and how we treat others so something that's going to leave an impact on the people around us that's really um insightful um i wanted to sort of bring everything together there and say i know you've probably got a, a list of other things that you want to share but i don't want to sort of take up too much of your time and also um, don't want this to go on for too long so we'll definitely um maybe get back together and talk about confidence at some point and raising sort of more confident or independent confident children um, but is there anything sort of vital that you want to add that you really wanted to say um, that I've not managed to let you sort of talk about yet well there's so many things I mean uh, but when it comes to this topic at the end of the day I would just say to parents first of all 
we have to build our self image and you know very often we beat ourselves and we are so hard on ourselves if we make a mistake and you're going to have a day when you might be maybe going to snap you're going to lose your patience you might shout uh, you might say something and then you're going to say oh I, I shouldn't say this and then parents are really obsessed will this leave a big consequence and uh, you know you just want to become aware of yourself and work on yourself but i would just say don't be too hard on yourself you're doing amazing job and uh, everybody is doing this you know nobody is perfect we all have good days and bad days um so just just be easy love yourself first right uh, be compassionate with yourself say you know i was really tired and uh, just let it let go of it just don't look in the past too much just look forward this is and something i, think- I would yeah, I love that. Be compassionate and like, you know, compassionate towards yourself. And I think um, that's really important because, and the other thing that I would just like to add is that it's okay to tell your child that you made a mistake, right? Like, I think sometimes we forget that, you know, just because we're a parent doesn't mean that you can't admit to your child that actually you lost your cool. No, we do that actually yeah it's very important that we admit because then we are all modeling them right if you shout and you say look i make a mistake i I wasn't behaving appropriately i'm really sorry for my behavior again you're emphasizing on your behavior i was very tired and that wasn't all right i'm going to behave better next time so you admit your mistake and now they're going to learn to admit their mistake and to apologize as well I think that's an amazing place to end. I'd love for you to tell us where is the best place to find you? Um, how do people and our listeners get in touch with you? So I have my website. It's www.nevenabajalets.com. And over there, they have my email. They have also my podcast. I have my own podcast as well. They have, uh, I have a free webinars that I'm launching. So one is already uh, ready over there of, around, about parenting. I also have some of my um, starting online courses. They're very good jump start for parents to give them some tools how to deal with different emotions and understand themselves better and their partner and child. Um, and then, yes, I do coaching so they can also book and apply for coaching over there. Uh, I have a free book, Three Steps for Successful Parenting. They can download my uh, free ebook. They're more than welcome. And uh, it's just going to ask them to subscribe and they're going to receive some newsletter and news and invitations to free webinars and events that I'm going to do in the future. So, yes. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'll link all of that into the show notes so the listeners um, will be able to find you easily. I'd like to thank you once again. Yes, I'm on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube as well. It's just my name, Nevin Abajal, so they can find me there as well. I'll link your website and your social channels um, in the show notes. Thank you again. And um, it was so lovely speaking with you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you.